A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me today. We're going to be talking about what is going on in New Mexico, where Governor Michelle Luan Grisham has called for a special session. You know, she had a very expansive gun control agenda ahead of the 30-day budget session, right? She wanted a ban on so-called assault weapons. She wanted a 14-business-day waiting period. She wanted to expand red flag laws. Uh, wanted to enact a uh, number of new gun-free zones around the state, including parks and playgrounds. Remember, she's tried to do that through uh, a, a public health order declaring a state of emergency over gun violence in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Uh, so far, a judge has allowed her to ban concealed carry on playgrounds, but that's it. Remember, originally it was the entire city of Albuquerque, right, in the entire county of Bernalillo County. Uh, and the federal court said, no, you can't do that. So then she revised her order for uh, parks and playgrounds. The judge said, mm, not sure about parks either. Uh, maybe playgrounds are sensitive places because kids are there. That was the judge's rationale. Uh, and so for now, the uh, ban on carry in parks is in effect, although I still don't know that anybody has actually been cited for carrying a concealed firearm in a park in Albuquerque or Bernalillo County. Um, but. When the 30-day budget session had concluded, Governor Grisham didn't get really anything she'd asked for. The 14-business-day waiting period was uh, reduced to seven days. Uh, the only gun-free zone, quote-unquote, that was enacted by the legislature was a, a ban on carrying firearms at or around polling places. But both of those bills have exceptions for concealed carry licensees. So if you have a concealed carry license in New Mexico... When this waiting period bill takes effect, as long as you present your concealed carry license, you don't have to wait seven days. You can walk out of the gun store with your firearm. If you have a concealed carry license, you can still carry at or around polling places. So I say the governor didn't get anything that she wanted. I mean, she declared war on concealed carry holders, and the state legislature uh, responded by enacting two gun control bills that exempt concealed carry holders from the provisions, right? So... When I saw that uh, Governor Grisham uh, was calling for a special session, I was concerned that uh, this is going to be a uh, an avenue to revive the governor's gun control bills that uh, failed to make it to her desk in the 30-day session. I will note, we still don't have a list of the bills that the governor says she wants lawmakers to consider, but at the moment, it looks like gun control is off the table for a special session. Um, we've got a couple of reports here. This from, I believe this is from a KOB or the Albuquerque Journal, excuse me, uh, saying the governor's proposed assault weapons bill, quote unquote, sponsored by Representative uh, Andrea Romero, was intended to curb gun violence by regulating the manufacture, possession, and sale of certain gas operated semi automatic weapons and devices. It died in committee after one house hearing. Now, it wasn't voted down. I mean, it just wasn't advanced any further. Of the 17 new public safety laws, higher penalties for second-degree murder were enacted, and a pretrial detention change will allow judges to hold someone charged with a felony without bond if that person picks up another felony charge while they're waiting to go uh, to trial. Senator Joe Cervantes, a Democrat from Las Cruces who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, says he believes the special session should focus on, quote, the absence of resources to enforce existing law. In other words, let's not talk about new gun control laws this session. Uh, let's talk about something else instead, right? How do you enforce the laws that are on the books? Uh, Senate Majority Leader Pete Worth, Worth rather, from uh, Santa Fe, said in a statement that legislative leadership has so far discussed uh, this and bills related to criminal competency and felons in possession of a firearm. He also said that those involved in talks agreed to wait on bills that address, quote-unquote, gun safety, and pretrial detention until next year's 60-day session. So, you know, what the Democrats call gun safety, because it polls better, we call gun control because that's what it is. And again, they sent a majority leader indicating that gun control legislation off the table during this special session. Governor Michelle Luan Grisham herself uh, spoke to uh, KOB TV in Albuquerque after the uh, special session was announced. She, too, declined to talk specific pieces of legislation, 
But she did say that she's still worried about crime. In fact, she said, uh, quote, I'm continuing to see an escalation of risk in our communities. I go to the grocery store and I go to the pharmacy. I don't think I've been once in a year and a half where a theft is not in progress. It's outrageous. Now, hang on a second here. You're telling me that every time the governor goes to the pharmacy or to the grocery store, she sees firsthand somebody stealing something? Doesn't she have her own security team? What Do they say anything to the store management? Do they alert police? What do they, what, 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 what does the governor do when she goes to the store and she sees this retail theft every time she goes? And by the way, why is she just now saying this? I mean, if, if that's been the case for a year and a half where she can't leave the house without seeing somebody stealing something. First of all, A, I would have thought that maybe that would have been a priority as opposed to going after lawful gun owners, but ah, whatever. Uh, The governor also expressed that uh, during the special session, she would like to see a law passed that would create stricter penalties for felons in possession of a firearm. She said, if you just got out and now you're possessing a firearm illegally, you're not rehabilitated. You are a risk and a threat to my public safety. If I can hold you in there for five more years, maybe you don't get rehabilitated, but I'm safer for those five years. Uh, listen, it is already a crime under both state and federal law to be a felon in possession of a firearm, right? But I have a problem with the way that uh, the governor is talking about this, because again, this is a blanket prohibition. It doesn't matter if you were convicted of a nonviolent felony or a felony. Actually, if you're punishable, if you committed a crime that's punishable by more than a year in jail, uh, it could be a misdemeanor offense and you're still prohibited from possessing a farm forever, right? Now, we know that the Supreme Court is interested in this. Um, You've got the Rahimi case involving domestic violence restraining orders. You've also got pending before the court. They haven't granted cert in these cases, but they are considering these cases in conference. Uh, Range versus Garland, that's the case of Brian Range, the Pennsylvania man who was convicted of falsifying his income on a food stamp application more than 20 years ago. It was a misdemeanor offense, but under Pennsylvania law at the time, it was punishable by more than a year in jail. Even though Brian Range only received probation, he's still been a prohibited person ever since. Uh, There is also the uh, Daniels case involving uh, Darnell Daniels, who was pulled over in Oklahoma, uh, had marijuana in his car. Uh, No, I think he had a fireman in his car, and he admitted to police that he smoked marijuana. So he was charged with being... An unlawful user of drugs in possession of a firearm, not a felon in possession of a firearm, but another prohibited person, right? Uh, And that, too, is a case that is pending before the Supreme Court. They have not granted cert, but they are set to consider uh, that case in conference and could accept that case to determine, again, whether or not uh, somebody who consumes marijuana, and in Oklahoma, it's legal to do so if you've got your medical marijuana license, uh, is prohibited from possessing a firearm. So it is an open question, I think, um, the law around prohibited persons. What I would like to see, and again, Governor Michelle Lujan Grissom is not going to do this, but I would like to see an actual rights restoration process in New Mexico. So when you've done your time, you've gotten out, you should have your rights restored. All of your rights. You should be able to vote. You should be able to go to church on Sunday without informing the state, and the state shouldn't be able to say, no, you can't go there. You should have your Fourth Amendment rights intact. And yes, you should have your right to keep and bear arms intact. Now, again, there may be circumstances where that's not appropriate, right? If there's a finding of dangerousness, uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett and a lot of other uh, justices on the Supreme Court have indicated that maybe that should be the test, right? But a flat-out, you committed a felony, you were released, but you still can't own a gun. And now I want to slap you uh, back behind bars for five years because we caught you with a gun. I have a problem with that. Um, but then again, I have a problem with almost everything that the governor of New Mexico is doing, uh, as do Republicans, by the way. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Greg Baca said, you know, anytime we get into the territory of crime prevention and addressing crime issues, there's always contention within the roundhouse. We've been unable in the past to settle those issues in 60 days. So what makes us think that we're going to be able to do this in just a few days? 
Republican leaders uh, saying that they believe border security also deserves attention during the special session. But they are also criticizing the governor for calling the special sessions, saying that, you know, this is an emergency. We've got to do this now. And then, but you don't have to come back till July. About three months from now. And about five months before they'll return for the regular session, Republican leaders question if the governor's public safety concerns are so pressing. Why not call the special session now? It's a great question. Uh, and I don't know what the answer is. But, I, I, you know, my first thought would have been, well, she does want to introduce gun control bills. She knows she doesn't have the votes for them right now. So she's trying to twist some arms, uh, calling a special session in July gives her some time to do so. And that still may very well be the case. Again, the governor has not said what specific pieces of legislation. She's not talking up gun control. Uh, and you saw the quote by the uh, Senate Majority Leader who said, well, yeah, we've decided that you know gun safety bills are off the table until the 60-day session. I hope that that's the case. But if I were a New Mexico gun owner, <laughs> I would still be contacting my state representative, my state senator, telling them, hey, don't vote for any gun control bills in the special session. I would be keeping a very close eye on what's going on in Santa Fe. Um, you know, we've had Zach Ford from the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association on the program multiple times this year. We'll have him back again before July. But I would also recommend if you are a New Mexico gun owner, you are not already a member of the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association, uh, go to their website. I believe it's nmssa.org. Sign up for their legislative alerts. Follow them on social media if you're on social media. And make sure that you are informed. Um, it could be, I'm not saying that this is the case, but it could be that this is, you know, a rope-a-dope tactic. That Democrats are hoping that gun owners will let their guard down, uh, will not be paying close attention because they're saying, oh, we're not going to consider any gun safety bills. And then at the last moment, bloop, they drop a bunch. Well, one or more uh, pieces of anti-gun legislation. So we are definitely keeping a close eye on what is going on in New Mexico right now. Things look to be good. Uh, it looks like they are avoiding the gun control debate because, frankly, I, I don't think it's going to go the way Michelle Lujan Grisham wants it to go. You know, even in this 30-day session, we did see plenty of movement on gun control bills through committee. And then they tended to stall out on the House and Senate floor, which tells me that they just simply didn't have the votes to bring them up uh, for passage. They, because if they brought them up, they, you know, put Democrats' feet to the fire, there were going to be some rural Democrats who voted no. And rather than risk an embarrassing outright loss, uh, the governor and her allies in the legislative leadership decided, all right, well, you know what, let's just keep them in limbo. Let's just hold off and uh, we'll try again. Maybe next year. Maybe in a special session. I don't know. Right now, anyway, it looks like um, they are a little, no pun intended, gun shy about gun control bills in the special session. But, again, that is subject to change. So, stay involved, stay engaged, and stay informed. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. Actually, we kind of have a twofer with our recidivist report and an Armed Citizen story. This out of uh, North Carolina, Ashford Department's attempted burglary suspect was on probation for gun and stolen property charges. I'm sorry, I said this was North Carolina, and this was uh, Mobile, Alabama. Apologies to the uh, people of North Carolina there. Uh, one of the alleged suspects in the uh, attempted burglary of the Ashford Apartments on Tuesday on probation for gun and stolen property charges uh, from three years ago, according to court documents. This is from uh, WALA. Police said they responded to a burglary in progress at the apartments where shots were fired by a resident. Officers said they discovered a 23-year-old male deceased on the ground Investigation revealed that the uh, deceased individual and 22-year-old Okoye Day were with a group of individuals attempting to break in when that armed resident fired shots in self-defense. Jail records show that Day has now been charged with first-degree burglary as well as certain persons forbidden to possess a firearm. According to documents, he was on informal probation after pleading guilty in 2023, so that the, the, the uh, crime took place in 2021, but he didn't actually go to trial until last year. And then he took a guilty plea to one count of discharging a firearm into an occupied building, as well as one count of receiving stolen property. As part of the conditions of his probation, he was not allowed to possess a firearm or be arrested for any new criminal conduct for five years. Uh, now, the DA's office in Mobile has filed a motion to revoke Day's probation as a result of the new charges. But again, 
you can't help but wonder why was a deal offered to begin with. Now, again, he pled guilty to one kind of discharge in a fire into an occupied building. We don't know what the original charge was. Was it a higher charge? Was this attempted murder? Was this aggravated assault? But uh, either way, sounds like a, a trigger was pulled in connection to a uh, an underlying crime here. So we're talking about a violent offense that resulted in nothing more than a slap on the wrist. And here we are just a year later, and Mr. Day once again charged with a very serious crime. Um, the uh, resident, by the way, the apartment complex, not expected to face any charges. Neither is the uh, woman in the uh, Pittsburgh area who shot and killed a home intruder this week. This is in uh, Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Uh, Beaver Falls, specifically. Beaver County DA Nate Bible says a um, woman was at her home, middle of the night. It was uh, Wednesday. When a uh, stranger broke through a basement window and gained entry inside her home, uh, Nate Bible said the door to her basement door opened, and there stands this guy who she had no idea who he was, and she ended up shooting him three times and killing him. The woman was armed with a 9 millimeter handgun when she heard the uh, sound of breaking glass, went downstairs, and came face-to-face with the intruder. Uh, KDKA asked the DA, did she do the right thing? Which is one of those gloriously stupid questions that uh, you will hear from reporters from time to time. Guy breaks into a woman's home. He's coming up through the basement. Door opens. He's right there. Stranger, middle of the night. Did she, did she do the right thing by shooting? The DA said, uh, yeah, I think so. In that situation, from a legal standpoint, yes, she did nothing wrong. I would say not only from a legal standpoint, I would say from a practical standpoint, she did nothing wrong. This guy was not in her home to deliver Girl Scout cookies. He wasn't there to, you know, turn on the TV and watch some Netflix. Uh, We may not know what his exact intentions were, but it is reasonable to believe that that woman's life was in danger when this stranger entered her home. Beaver Falls Police, county detectives continue to investigate, but uh, the DA says he does not believe that they'll be requesting criminal charges. He said, you know, if somebody enters your house, they're making that conscious decision. They're there to steal from you or to hurt you in other ways. And you have that right to protect yourself and use deadly force. Uh, KDKA's uh, Jennifer Barrasso followed up with, and by the way, I apologize to Jennifer Barrasso. She may be a very nice person, very smart person. Boy, she has some dumb questions. Um, the follow-up, uh, well, what should people do to protect themselves if they don't have a gun? I mean, uh, th- th- that's great, but why include that? Why immediately go to, well, whatever you don't want to own a gun? What can you do? Why not ask Nate Bible, do you think it's a good idea for people to have a firearm for self-defense in their home? Now, I have no idea what he would say. But it seems to me like when you're dealing with a armed citizen story, a defensive gun use, maybe you want to ask a question about that instead of immediately going to uh, pivoting to, you know, uh, well, what happens for those of us who don't want to own a gun? Um, Bible, by the way, responded professionally. He said, well, there are classes to learn self-defense. Get a big dog to help you outside of a firearm. Anything can be used as a weapon. Uh, which, by the way, don't tell the gun control advocates that, right? So I like Nate Bible's response, but uh, man, I, I think uh, this reporter, maybe Stephen Gatowski from the Reload, can uh, make a field trip to uh, KDKA and help their reporters learn a little bit more about uh, covering these types of stories. All right, finally today, our good deed of the day in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Uh, An anonymous Good Samaritan in West Virginia who came to the aid of a teen and friends who were in a car accident the other day. Now the uh, teen's family hoping to connect with the stranger who helped save this teenager, uh, Adavon Tay Thomas. His mom, Cassie Minshouse, said, we're not sure exactly who it is, but we would love to thank him. It was Sunday when uh, Thomas and two of his friends were in a car, they crashed into a tree in Huntington, West Virginia. 
Tay says he remembers the stranger was passing by and stopped, acted without hesitation, he said. But that stranger is yet to be identified. He went on his way after he uh, saw that the uh, kids were okay. Um, Cassie Minshaus says the boys could have still been trapped in the car, you know, if they didn't have somebody to help them get out. So they are now going to the media in the hopes that they can, uh, you know, convince this good Samaritan to come forward. Uh, Tay released a uh, short little video from the hospital. He said, I just want to let you all know I'm feeling 10 times better in the past few days. That's for sure. He's going to have at least three hours of physical therapy every day. Uh, he did suffer some, you know, pretty serious injuries, but thankfully it looks like he is going to recover. And I hope that the family is able to connect with that good Samaritan because I'm sure the good Samaritan wants to know uh, what happened to this kid. I will never forget. I was driving home. This is probably whew, I, 2019, uh, fall of 2019, driving home from Richmond late one night. Uh, I was on the uh, Laura Ingram show, The Ingram Angle on uh, Fox, and I had to go into Richmond for uh, the, the studio. This is before you know COVID changed everything and we could start doing things from our home. And so I'm driving through rural Virginia, probably close to midnight at that point. And I saw two blinking yellow lights in the woods off to my right. Uh, I'm about five or six miles from my house at that point. And at first, I didn't think anything about it. And then something told me th th those were hazard lights in the woods. And so I turned around and drove back. And sure enough, there was a car that was on its side, wedged between two trees. I have no, to this day, I have no idea how the young woman who was driving that car managed to get out. But she did. So when I got there, she's standing by the car in the woods, I think in shock at that point. Um, I immediately called 911, uh, asked her, you know, is there somebody that we can call for you? Um, she called her mom, let her know what was going on. And I stayed there until the ambulance arrived and the police arrived and they took her away. I gave my statement to police. And that was it. I had her uh, mom's phone number on my phone because I let her use the uh, the number. Um, but I didn't feel comfortable, you know, calling and saying, hey, your daughter okay? Never heard back. I, I hope that she's okay. I mean, she was upright. She was talking. She had what appeared to be some, you know, superficial cuts and bruises on her. But uh, to this day, I still think about that young woman and I hope that she's okay. So... I, I hope that this family is able to reconnect with the good Samaritan who was there when this uh, teen and his friends needed help, uh, because I think it would be not only good for the family, but uh, would hopefully provide some closure for that good Samaritan as well. Anyway, whoever you are out there in West Virginia, you got a family who's looking to say thanks, and I hope that you all are able to connect. All right. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. I'm looking forward to being back with you again on Monday. But don't forget to check out BearingArms.com between now and then. We're keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information. The good, the bad, and yes, the ugly as well. And there is unfortunately some ugliness out there. We got it all covered for you. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just go to BarionArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. Exclusive news stories, columns, analysis, because your support really does matter. And it truly does make a difference. So, thank you again. Hope you have a great rest of your week and a good weekend ahead. We'll see you back here in a couple of days. Until then, be well. Be safe and be free.